Welcome to the Full Story Series right here at Comic Storian, your home for your favorite narrated comic books. I'm Benny and I'll be your narrator for today. The Full Story Series is us taking a collection of older videos and just turning them into a very long video for you. And today we're going to give you the Red Hood origin story, then we're going to tell you the Lost Days as a part of his revival, and then we're going to tell you the Under the Red Hood storyline. That should be together a origin to Under the Red Hood. So basically how he was created to his initial meeting with Batman where he reveals what had actually happened. Hope you guys enjoy and don't forget to hang around at the end of the video. Story begins with Batman and Robin hunting down a child pornography operation in a warehouse in Gotham City. When Batman goes in to shut it down, his partner Robin rushes into combat with reckless abandon. While this is easy work for the dynamic duo to take down these criminals, Batman does reprimand Robin for his brash tactics. When he goes home, he has a discussion with Alfred concerning the boy Wonder, who at this time is Jason Todd. With Dick Grayson recently retired as Robin, he decided to recruit another Robin that he took in from the streets. Something is wrong with this new Robin. Most of it stems from the fact that he's still mourning the loss of his parents, something that Bruce Wayne has put behind him, but Alfred confirms Bruce's suspicions when he decides to remove Jason as an active duty Robin. Jason, however, overhears this argument and then gets into a verbal argument with Bruce before storming off. Batman is called in by Commissioner Gordon because of some very grim news. The Joker has escaped Arkham Asylum, leaving many dead people in his wake. The world's greatest detective is on the case to find out what his oldest rival is up to, and we soon learn that the Joker has escaped only to discover his funds have been depleted. But don't worry, he still has an ace up his sleeve. He has his very own cruise missile. He's had it stowed away for some time, and instead of using it to murder innocents, he decides to hawk the weapon to some terrorists in the Middle East. His goal is for a change of pace that doesn't involve crime, but something involving international politics. And with this money, he just might do that. Meanwhile, Jason Todd is wandering the streets of Gotham alone. He comes across his old home, a place of happier memories. Suddenly, an old neighbor recognizes Jason, and she has a gift for him. Old heirlooms from his family. Jason takes these items back to Wayne Manor to look through them, to get in touch with his past. However, he soon comes across his birth certificate and he learns some shocking news. While his father's name is on the document, his mother's name is different. Water damage has ruined the document, but he identifies the first letter of his mother's name as the letter S. And using his father's old address book, he learns that there are three female contacts with names beginning with that letter. Using the bad computer, Jason soon discovers that these three names are Sharman Rosen, Shiva Woosman, and Dr. Sheila Haywood. All three women are operating overseas in the Middle East and Africa. And so Jason decides that he's going to find them on his own because he thinks Batman wouldn't understand his desire to meet his mother. Using the wealth and resources of Bruce Wayne, Jason leaves Gotham in search of his true birth mother, who might still actually be alive. Little does Jason know, though, Joker has already hijacked a plane with his cruise missile to go to the Middle East. Shortly after, Batman uses his incredible detective skills to discover that Joker is in possession of a nuclear weapon that he deduces that he's taking it to Lebanon to sell to terrorists. However, Alfred informs Batman that Jason has run away and he has to make the decision to find Jason Todd or pursue his deadliest foe Joker overseas. It's a moral dilemma for Batman that will change his life forever. Batman touches down in Lebanon and he tracks down the plane the Joker arrived in and that's when he learns the Joker killed the pilots and successfully transported the cruise missile with him. Batman's worst fears are confirmed. He knows that in order to find Joker, he's gonna have to go through the violent streets of Beirut to track down his prey. Meanwhile, Jason has also arrived in Beirut in search of Charmin Rosen. Using his detective skills, he finds a hotel that she's staying in. Before he's able to ask for her, he's grabbed off the streets by none other than Bruce Wayne. Bruce recently learned that the man selling the missile for the Joker is a man named Peter Brando, and he too is staying in the same hotel. Jason tells Bruce that he's here to track down a woman who might be his mother, and Bruce tells Jason that the reason he's here is to stop the Joker. While it seems that their cases are separate, they soon see Sharman Rosen and Peter Brando walking past the hotel, and that's when they realize they are actually on the same case, and they begin to track the two of them out into the desert of Lebanon using their bat gliders. They soon arrive at a camp near the Israeli border, and lo and behold, Joker is there to make the deal. One million dollars for his cruise missile. The terrorist is anxious to use the weapon and begins to arm it, so Batman and Robin begin to dismantle Joker's thugs and the Palestinian terrorists slowly and methodically. During the fighting though, Peter Brando realizes that Sharman has been deceiving him and she's actually an Israeli agent and threatens to kill her. Jason, seeing his potential mother in danger, recklessly moves in to stop Peter. 
Before Brando can pull the trigger, the terrorist arms the cruise missile and launches it, except the missile malfunctions, creating a giant explosion. Somehow, the nuclear warhead did not detonate, but in the chaos, Joker escapes without his precious suitcase filled with all of the money he needs to start his new operation. After all of the villains are cleaned up, Batman and Robin question Charmin Rosen about her past. Had she ever been to Gotham City? And has she ever had a child there? Sadly, the answer is no. And Jason tells Batman that he will now go searching for Shiva Woozin back in Baruch. Batman agrees to come with him to make sure that he stays out of trouble, and at the nearby airport, Joker in disguise buys a ticket to fly to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, for reasons unknown. The search for Jason's potential mother, Shiva Woozman, begins with a troubling abduction in Barut. Batman and Robin learn that she's been abducted and taken back to Bekaa Valley, and in order to infiltrate their camp, they beat up some terrorists to take their clothes as a disguise. The two begin the dread work of incapacitating the henchmen quickly and quietly, but it all seems so easy to them, too easy. They take a look in the tent where Shiva is supposedly being held captive and she isn't there, and Batman deduces that this is a terrorist training camp, and then a hit over Jason's head leaves him unconscious. Batman turns to learn that Lady Shiva is the woman in charge of this camp, and she also happens to be the woman that they think might be Jason Todd's mother. What proceeds is a magnificent duel of martial arts between Lady Shiva and the caped crusader. She proves to be much more than a match for Batman, and the combat is drawn out until Jason wakes up to see Batman and the woman that he thinks might be his mother fighting to the death. Jason decides to help Batman, and with a surprise strike to her back, Batman finishes off Lady Shiva with a couple of moves knocking her out. He then uses a time-delayed charge to destroy the terrorist camp, and the two take her away for questioning. Again, they ask her a simple question. Did you ever have a child? She gleefully replies that she's had many children all over the world. Batman is obviously not amused by her humor, so he takes out a dose of sodium pentothal to force the truth out of her. This time, the answer is more direct, no. Satisfied, they leave her out in the middle of the desert, left with only one more option, the Dr. Sheila Haywood. And it seems that someone else has found her first. Over in a famine relief camp in Ethiopia, an all too familiar face barges in on Dr. Sheila Haywood hard at work, and she recognizes him immediately, the Joker. He knows this woman from her troubled past in Gotham City, and plans to use her connections to gain medical supplies in order to sell them on the black market. Yes, the Joker has been reduced to hijacking trucks. Just another victim of re -economics. that's me. So the Joker's next plan is set, another fateful coincidence. It takes a little time for Batman and Robin to locate Dr. Sheila Haywood in the Ethiopian refugee camp. Innocent starving refugees are all around them and perhaps this is the place where Jason Todd's true mother is. They easily find her tent and then the two of them in their public identities of Bruce Wayne and Jason Todd introduce themselves. Sheila immediately realizes that Jason is her long lost son and in a moment of elation, the two embrace and Batman looks on. He leaves them for a time to have their happy reunion, and the doctor relates her sad story to Jason, revealing that after giving birth to him, she was a part of a botched operation and it ruined her medical career in the United States. She fled for England, where his father, Willis Todd, was going to meet her. However, he fell in love with Katherine Johnson, and the two of them got married. After that happened, she abandoned Jason because she didn't think she would ever win a custody battle because of her troubled past. She has since dedicated her life to helping people, but the reunion is cut short as she gets back to work distributing food to the refugees. Jason walks along in the camp when he recognizes that familiar face in skin-colored makeup, the Joker. He walks into Sheila's tent, and Jason eavesdrops on their conversation. He learns that the Joker is blackmailing Sheila in order to enact his villainous scheme. Joker leaves with Dr. Haywood to go to a warehouse where the medical supplies are being kept, and Jason follows, acting alone without Batman. He follows them to the warehouse where he learns that Joker is taking medical crates and replacing them with crates of a lethal laughing gas to kill everyone in four acres after they get opened. With this grim news, Jason heads off to find Batman, and he relays the evil plan to Batman, but by the time they get back to the warehouse, they see the trucks are already delivering the crates of deadly gas to the nearby camp. Batman begins to think that they can stop them in time with his mini bat helicopter, but he has to go alone. It is a mini bat helicopter, not the big one. He tells Jason to watch after the warehouse with explicit warning, do not act until he returns. But as the bat helicopter takes off, Jason makes a bold decision to save his mother from the clown prince of crime. He goes into the warehouse and he finds Dr. Haywood, and he tells her that he knows what's going on and reveals to her that he's actually Robin, the boy wonder, Batman's sidekick. And she tells him that the Joker is long gone and guides him into a warehouse to show him something. That something is the Joker with a gang of thugs in tow. Jason turns around, and then what should have been the happiest day of his life turns into the worst day of his life as he sees his own mother pointing a gun at him. 
It seems that the good doctor has been embezzling medical supplies on her own to make money on the side. And if he interferes, it could make her life worse. With Jason surrounded, the Joker proceeds to give Jason the beating of a lifetime. He can barely fight back, and the Joker nearly beats him to death with a crowbar. Blood is everywhere, and his mother looks on and lights a cigarette. Batman is in hot pursuit of the military truck with the poison gas, but his bat helicopter gets shot down by unsuspecting soldiers. After incapacitating the soldiers, Batman tells the drivers that this crisis is over and to turn around. Batman needs to get back to Jason, and he uses one of the convoy trucks to race back to the warehouse, where the Joker is. Speaking of the Joker, he's back in the warehouse deciding his next move. With Jason near death, he decides to tie up Dr. Haywood and blow the warehouse up to remove any evidence that he did this. Sheila is helpless to do anything after being betrayed by the Joker, and as time is ticking away on the bomb, Jason miraculously gets a second win and he unties his mother. But he's too beat up to deactivate the bomb, and their best option is to escape. With only seconds to spare, they make their way to the door, only to find that it's locked. The Joker locked them in the warehouse. Batman sees the Joker driving off, and he opts to go to the warehouse to see if Jason is alright. But as he arrives in his truck, he sees a massive explosion. Jason! Oh my god! Oh my god, no! Now, at the end of Batman 427, there's a famous page that followed the exploding warehouse. It was an advertisement for readers to decide what was going to happen next. And there were two 1-800 numbers printed there. One was to tell DC that Jason Todd Robin should live. The other one was to tell DC that Jason Todd Robin should die. And so, on September 16th of 1988, the comic book readers would decide the fate of the boy wonder. What happened next was the result of those phone calls. Batman slowly walks through the remains of the warehouse that he left Jason at to watch over. Worry begins to wash over his face as he braces for the worst, and he blames himself for leaving Jason behind. He regrets his decision that led him to recruiting another Robin after Dick moved on. He moves through his memories of Jason Todd from his first meeting to their encounter with Two-Face, and as he looks through the rubble of his memories and the warehouse, he finds Dr. Sheila Haywood lying there, nearly dead. In her last breath, she tells Batman that the Joker trapped them in the warehouse with the bomb in order to kill them. And in the final moments before the explosion, Jason jumped in front of her to save her life. He was the hero in the end. He was a good boy. He loved his mother. With the regrets of her own life choices, she dies in Batman's arms. And the Dark Knight silently continues to go through the wreckage, hoping beyond hope that Jason is okay. And he sees him at last. He goes to check for a pulse. And there's nothing. He's lost him. Jason Todd, the boy wonder, is dead. The Joker is off selling his stolen medical supplies. As he receives his money, two secret servicemen from Iran are there to meet him. They are there at the behest of a man that wished to speak with the Joker. They go into the next room to find that it is the Grand Ayatollah himself, and he's there to offer the Clown Prince of Crime a government position. The Joker's dream has come true. Back at the ruins, Batman as Bruce Wayne deals with the authorities. He removes any evidence of Robin's disguise and he answers the questions that they have, keeping the truth to himself. No authority will keep him from dealing with the Joker. Soon after, Batman follows the Joker to his location in Ethiopia, and the only thing that he can find is a warehouse filled with dead henchmen and a bloody message. B. See you at 42nd and 1st. J. Batman takes the body of Sheila and Jason back to Gotham, where they have a small funeral that only Commissioner Gordon, Barbara Gordon, and Alfred attend. No one knew the identity of Jason Todd, and all of his family is gone. Alfred tells Batman that he can contact the Nightwing to help him, but Bruce refuses. No help from here on. That's the way I want it. Batman quickly deduces the address that the Joker gave him was not in Gotham, but in New York City at the United Nations Plaza. And when he gets there, he's prepared to find out what the Joker's game is. But that's when he's greeted by someone else entirely different, Superman. Superman is there at the request of the State Department because the Iranian government warned them that Batman may arrive. Superman tells Batman that there is a new ambassador for Iran who has diplomatic immunity and all of his past crimes are washed away. Superman is there to stop an international incident and he tells Batman to walk away. But Batman finds it weird because Superman refuses to state who the ambassador is and he even punches the Man of Steel out of anger, bruising his hand. It is then that the new Iranian ambassador steps out of a car and it is as Batman feared. The Joker is the ambassador. Batman has a meeting with a CIA agent who tells him that he needs to leave the Joker alone and the president has asked Superman to keep Batman from doing anything that might start a war with Iran. After the agent leaves, Superman asks Batman about the death of his ward, Jason Todd. And Batman confirms that it was Robin and the Joker is responsible. Superman pleads with him not to put his vengeance above the country's interests. But Batman will not be swayed from his mission and he leaves. Bruce Wayne begins to pull strings so that he can attend the UN meeting where the Iranian ambassador is going to be speaking. But that isn't for another day, so Batman decides to hunt down the Joker where he's staying. Batman gives Joker the ultimatum. Surrender yourself to Arkham Asylum. 
The Joker knows that there is nothing Batman can do, so he just mocks him and his dead partner Robin. This gives Batman the confirmation that he needed to truly learn that the Joker killed Jason Todd. Batman leaves before the Joker can shoot him, and at the UN meeting the next night, Bruce Wayne is in attendance, and the Joker takes the stage. He stands there and he gives a crazy speech about how the UN will not be allowed to keep Iran down. And then he unleashes poisonous laughing gas on the UN members in attendance. All of the world's leaders would have surely been dead, but Superman in disguise was there to save the day. Superman breathes in all of the deadly laughing gas, and he stops the Joker's mad plot. But the Joker has a backup plan. Explosives set in the UN building overnight. In the mayhem, Batman jumps out and he begins to fight with the Joker, but the Joker has already started his getaway and he runs out of the building towards a helicopter. Batman leaps after him, jumping on board as it takes off. On board the helicopter, Arab bodyguards shoot indiscriminately at Batman and the Joker, wounding the Joker and killing the pilot, which causes the helicopter to crash into a nearby building exploding with the Joker in it. Before the crash, Batman leaps out of the helicopter and into the water below, with Superman there to pull him out. Batman demands that they find the corpse of the Joker, but he knows they won't. The struggle of Batman and the Joker is once again left unresolved with the death of Jason Todd in their wake. Our story begins years ago at Ra's al Ghul's mansion while he discusses business with his daughter Talia. As the two talk, Ra's mentions that the detective's partner has been killed. Jason Todd is no longer in the world of the living. The ramblings indicate that it was at the hands of the Joker, and Talia stops asking, how is he? And Roz says, well, the boy is dead, crushed in an explosion in a warehouse. Talia tells him, no, how is Batman? Roz says that he is unharmed, but if you're asking about his emotional state, I would obviously have no knowledge of that. Don't act as though I am unaware of the feelings you have for him. As Roz walks off, he tells her that they will monitor talk in Gotham, but she must mind her work. She is not to reach out to him on this. As the months go by, Talia keeps tabs on Gotham, gathering any information on Batman and his mental state. However, one night she found someone else. Someone who looked like Jason Todd. As Roz and Talia watch from a control room, Roz says that he wants to see it. The young man before them was unresponsive in any way, except whenever he was attacked. When Roz gave the order, the men below began to attack Jason, and as a reflex, Jason knocked out each of them. After he was done, he returned to his unresponsive state, not even saying a word. The next day, Talia speaks with Roz, telling him that this man is half dead, received massive trauma, has flash burns from an explosion, and he was found wandering a road in a suit and tie. His clothes were dirty with soil, and he had dirt in his fingernails, which would indicate that he... Roz finishes the sentence, stating, he dug himself out of a buried coffin. Talia goes on stating that he is not a clone. Their blood samples match those that they were able to obtain, meaning that this person is the real Jason Todd. As Roz watches the doctors walking with Jason, he tells Talia that he wants her to find out how this man cheated death. Sift through every inch of dirt that he has ever walked on, and no matter what, the detective must not know about this. After speaking with a thug, he beat Jason with a crowbar. Going through the police reports, and even investigating the coffin that Jason crawled out of, Talia is nowhere closer to finding any answers. As time went on, Talia continued testing Jason, and the doctor watching over him says that his physical conditioning isn't an issue. It's his mental capacity. He's not improving. He doesn't respond to anything other than when he's attacked, which could be some form of muscle memory. Jason eats, he covers himself when he's cold, but he has no sense of the world. By now, they would have hoped to have seen his brain utilizing other undamaged cells, but he's not getting any better. Talia tells the doctor that he is wrong, and then she heads down into the room with everyone. She slaps Jason across the face and shouts, you will never fight her. So if it's just him reacting to attacks, explain that to her. After the testing, Talia takes Jason outside and tells him that he misses him. Since losing him, he has changed. He's become unforgiving. And in a way, she thinks that maybe him and Dick Grayson gave him light gave him hope. He feels responsible for this, feels as if he failed. He really does miss him. But as Jason sits there, he doesn't respond. And then Talia sees a single tear running down Jason's cheek. After bringing Jason back home, Roz stops Talia, telling her that this ends now. We've had the boy for over a year. We have no clue how he came to be. This whole thing has since turned into an obsession. Talia says that Jason is getting better. And in time, they will learn the truth. If not from research, then Jason himself. Roz tells her to stop. 
He knows what this is truly about, and no, he won't love her for this. Performing a miracle and restoring the boy to everything that he was, and then returning him to the detective? It will not make him love her. In the morning, we will be sending the boy away to be cared for and kept, protected and sheltered out of respect for his mentor and his present caretaker. As Roz retires down to the Lazarus pit, Talia thinks that tonight they shall leave then. Centuries ago, her father discovered these fountains of youth, and since then has deemed that he and he alone will bathe in their waters. Jason was dead, murdered, buried, and mourned. But for him to return to this world is a miracle. Jason Todd was meant for something, and only time will tell what that is. She's doing this out of love and hopes that in stepping into the Lazarus pit, it will guide him into what he is to become. A short while later, after learning what happened, Roz shouts, demanding to know where he is. I am to believe that you have taken Jason half a mile from the sanctum of the pit to a cliffside and hurled him into the waters with only a survival kit? How can you be so sure that the pit has not driven him mad? Perhaps not tonight or tomorrow. It could take weeks or months or decades. You have no conception of the power that you are trifling with. Jason Todd is an unknown entity. We do not know what force has returned him from beyond. And you have just empowered him with the nature of the pit. Elsewhere, as Jason walks throughout the streets, he begins to think. The Joker had murdered him, but he's still alive. The Joker is alive to hurt, kill, maim. Still alive to rob people of their friends and families. He has to know what he did, how he left him, how it felt, and now he's back and no one knows why. But he does. It's obvious. He's come back to do what needs to be done. Several days later in Gotham, Jason sits in an alley looking at the Batmobile. For someone to catch Batman, they will have to wait and put the time in. Which lucky for him, he has plenty of, thanks to Talia, access to some very fat overseas accounts. So to lure out Batman, one would have to set up a deal that even he couldn't ignore. Find the biggest fish that he could take the bait. All the while, Batman is off dealing with a fake setup. It's just to know how to deal with him. There are a few things about the Batmobile that no one except him, Grayson, and Alfred would ever know. It can sense thermals, air currents, and even has video recognition. But even there are chinks in the armor. For example, this wetsuit is made of a high-end seal work, invisible to thermal, and has reflective fibers, which happens to play hell with video. So to do this, you would have to be slow, five seconds per inch slow, but still leave plenty of time to plant the bomb and make it out before Batman gets back. As Jason finishes up, he heads into the abandoned apartments overlooking the alley, and he waits for him to return. While he watches, he thinks, how hard could it have been? Just killed the monster that took me away. The truth is that Batman never really did give a damn about his Robins. He was the one that made this happen. He has no one else to blame but himself. As Batman returns to the Batmobile, Jason gets ready to press the switch. Then he decides not to. Later, Jason tells Talia that it's not what she thinks. He didn't lose his nerve. He just couldn't let him go so easy. He would have never known what happened or why. Batman would never know that it was him. So instead of killing him from the shadows, he will face him. He will kill him with his own hands. Batman will see his face just before he's taken out of this world. Jason then turns back asking, will you help? And Talia tells him, of course. But in her mind, she thinks back to what her father said and says that he was right. She has unleashed a curse upon this world. Later, and with Talia's connections, Jason meets with the German known as Egon. He loves ska music and drinks a disgusting cherry-flavored energy drink all day. And he murders people for a living. And he's teaching him how it's done. He brings down a man and he says, that's good, now how would you finish him? Jason puts his foot to his neck and Egon tells him that the neck is thick and might not give. Jason then says that he puts his full weight behind it maybe, but he is also knocked out. So he could always stomp on the bridge of his nose and get into his brain pan. Egon says, fair enough. But you're still stupidly going for the head and not the eyes. Getting angry too easily will just waste and show that you're an idiot. As the two walk out, Egon mentions that he may have broken his ribs in there. Derek will escort him into the city to get some x-rays. Jason tells him it was probably just a bruise, and Egon stops him, telling him that he pays weekly. If he punctured any of his lungs and dies, he loses his fee. So go to the town. Days go by as Jason continues his training, but one night after returning, Derek asks, What's your story? How does some kid have enough money to buy time with Egon? Jason brushes off the question and he tells him that he always invested wisely. And Derek goes on telling him, Yeah, everyone has their secrets. But I've been watching and I can tell you're good. That's why me and another guy have been talking. Maybe we can get you some work with us. Before Jason can answer, he listens and hears footsteps coming, but not coming for him. 
so it's best to just watch. Seconds later, Egon kicks Derek in the back and then again in the face. After he falls, he goes stomping on Derek's face and then he tells Jason that he will forgive him. Some of his men forget that they have to refrain from discussions. Jan will take him back to his room now. As Jason gets into the truck, he notices two trucks off in the distance and he hears whimpering. But not the whimpers that dogs make. After staying with the Germans so long, Jason has learned their patterns and when people are watching him and when they are not. And right now he only has two hours to figure out what's in those trucks. As Jason jumps out of his window, he remembers Egon mentioning something about the west side before being brought back. And so he decides to head down the west road. After sneaking down the snowy roads, Jason finds the west side compound and he sees trucks from before. And then he moves in closer. When he looks into the window, he sees the trucks were moving children. And by his count, there's 42 of them. All drugged, all undernourished. Jason then looks back at Egon's office and he sneaks in to look through any paperwork as to what he could be doing. And once inside, Jason finds a ledger. And though he's been writing in code, Jason can make out numbers. Big numbers. This is a slave trade. Egon is selling those children. And as Egon's men start to load the children back up into the truck, Jason says that it's going to take them about 45 minutes before they can get on the road and move out. It will leave him plenty of time. After finishing loading up all of the children, Egon's men drive out. But before they can get any farther, they find a flaming truck in the middle of the road. The passenger shouts to the driver to turn back, but as he finishes his sentence, the driver is shot in the arm. As the passenger leans back up, he feels like gun being pressed against his head. And Jason tells him that he is bleeding out through his shoulder. So he can either drive or take a bullet. His choice. A few hours later, Egon returns to the office shouting on the phone that they are two hours late. Find out where they went! But back in the office, the door opens and Jason tells him, It's okay, I got them. And he fires a shot into Egon. Egon ducks and then he tackles Jason outside shouting and asking, What is he doing? Egon then slams Jason into a tree and Jason tells him, It's cute, your accent gets thicker when you're pissed off. Then Egon headbutts him and throws him to the ground, shouting that he can beat him. He taught him how to fight. And Jason tells him, No, you can't. That's why I poisoned your energy drinks. Egon stumbles back as he begins to foam with the mouth and then he falls to his knees motionless. Some time passes and Talia meets with Jason and tells him, it's funny, she finds him a teacher and he murders him. Jason tells her that murder sounds fancy. He didn't orchestrate whacking him over inheritance. He was a killer for hire and he made extra money selling children as sex toys. So tell him that the world isn't better off without him. Talia smiles and Jason asks, what's that for? And Talia tells him, nothing. It's just that you're learning. After some time, Jason's next stop is London to learn about the bomb making from Shurik Avanko. He has worked with IRL, PLO, and a few Aryan supremacist groups in Germany, and now him. After a day of working together, Shurik tells Jason that he can come with them to have a drink with his friends. They're Russians, and they might not be as smart as him, but they are good drinkers. As Jason sits with everyone, they all laugh and they drink, and then Jason sees another man walk into the bar. Shurik tells the group that he'll be a moment. He's just making some more room for vodka. Then he enters the bathroom with the man. His name is Yuri Karnov. He's in the Russian mob. Later that night at another pub, Jason tells Talia that it wasn't hard for him to find information on Yuri. In fact, he's well known. Yuri is a part of the Ivangen clan, and they've got three police task forces and Interpol crawling all over them, which means a person will wonder why they need a bomber. Talia says that this is becoming a habit. His little investigations into the inner workings of these criminal organizations. A pattern has formed between them, Talia and Jason. She is assisting him in finding teachers. He studies under them to expand his repertoire, and then half of them end up dead. Jason tells her, It's not without reason. The surveillance expert was a pedophile. The small arms guy ran a smack ring, but half of his product was poison. And the close combat master was planning on killing her own husband and daughters. Talia sits back stating, she isn't criticizing, just pointing out the obvious. His road to revenge seems to have brought on a new interest or an old one. She pulls out a folder from her purse saying that she has some new business and she wanted to show him. Jason pulls the photos out and he sees Batman and a new Robin. Talia tells him that she has some operatives doing low-level work in Gotham, and these photos were taken 72 hours ago. The new Robin. His name is Timothy Drake. Talia then asks if he's going to be alright, and Jason tells her, Ha! <laughs> sure! Why wouldn't I? As he goes back to his room, he lines the photos on his walls. And he stares. The next day, he heads out to follow Shurik to an old barn where Yuri has come out to meet them. As Jason listens in, Yuri says that they need to move their plan up by three weeks and no, they don't have a choice. The longer that they wait, the more connections that they lose. Their business is already dying. 
Shurik tells him that he can't do nine targets in that time. He could do maybe six, maybe seven. Yuri tells him that's fine as long as the blame goes where it's supposed to. And as they go on, Jason learns that Yuri has hired Shurik to detonate a series of bombs all over London and make it look like an Arab terrorist cell. The UK will focus on their terrorists, and they will leave the clan alone, seeing them as a second-tier problem. All they have to do is murder 700 people in a single afternoon. Shurik once told him that if he was going to do a big job, make sure to have a staging area, so that if the need comes, he can abandon his work and never return. As Jason looks into the warehouse where they're having their meeting at, he finds the bombs and he thinks that it's good that Shurik takes his own advice. Shurik made the bombs pretty low tech to hide the fact that they were going to be detonated remotely, but after changing around some of the wires and the faulty ones, all he'll have are duds. Just as Jason shuts the case of the bombs, Yuri's men appear asking what the hell is going on. And Jason thinks that he's lucky that they're in London and no one is supposed to be carrying guns because that means that he can fight them off. However, through the punches, Jason hears a click and the sound of metal. A clip going into an MP5. As the gunman opens fire, Jason jumps back and he quickly sees that since he's been using handsprings, he dropped his own gun. He looks around and sees the front door is blocked, so there's only one thing that he can do. He starts pushing the boxes forward to where the bombs are being kept and he tosses one of them at the hitman. As they look at the bomb slide by, they ask what is that and Jason jumps up telling him, It's my exit strategy. He runs straight at the door and the bomb goes off, launching him outside. And when he looks up, he sees Yuri. And Yuri tells his men to kill him. And Jason stands up telling him, Just wait a second! I came down here to work on the bombs. Shurik told me the deadline had been moved up. And he didn't want to tell you that he needed more time, so I'm only here to help. Yuri tells one of his men to call Shurik to confirm that story, but before the call can connect, Jason vomits all over Yuri's shoes. He wipes his mouth telling him, I'm sorry, I'm just so nervous sometimes. And in the moment of hesitation from Yuri's men, Jason grabs Yuri and pulls out his gun, shooting Yuri in the foot. He then spins Yuri around and holds the gun to his head, telling the other men that Yuri will bleed out in just a second. I shot off a chunk of his foot. So before the police can arrive and find all of us carrying illegal firearms in a burning building, we should probably go our separate ways. The men keep their guns trained at Jason and Yuri shouts for them, Dude, just let him go! After escaping from the clan, Jason heads over to Shurik's place to find some more information. Once he tied up Shurik and placed a bomb over him, Shurik began to tell him all about Yuri's plan. The bombs are going to be placed in the Arab teen's backpacks and detonated to act as if they were just another suicide bomber. Jason races through London deactivating the bombs on Yuri's list, all except for one. The girl Susan is not where she was supposed to be, so Jason calls her, telling her that she needs to pull over wherever she is. Susan says that she's sorry, but who is he again? Jason shouts, I'm Detective Miles, and I have reason to believe that your life is in danger. You need to pull over and give me your location. Susan says that she can't. She's on the Westminster Bridge. Jason swerves through the traffic, asking, what kind of car are you in? And after giving the description, Jason quickly pulls up next to her. He shouts, hand over the bag! And Susan says that she's not sure, until she opens the bag and sees a bomb. Susan tosses the bag out, and Jason takes it and pulls the bomb out to defuse it. But as he does, a real officer shouts to Jason, asking, what do you think you're doing parking your bike on a sidewalk? Jason pulls his gun out, and he points it at the officer, telling him to hush! Daddy's busy! Jason continues his work and he sees that the bomb isn't set up by remote, it's set up by timer. And time's almost up. He looks over the bridge and tells the officer that he wants it noted for the record. I did check for ships below. And he tosses the bomb. An explosion goes off in the water and everyone runs over to see what's going on. Using that opportunity, Jason jumps back on his bike and he heads back to his hideout. Right now, he just needs to get out of there. There's too many people that have seen his face today and he should have enough time to. But as he opens up his door to his flat, he sees Yuri and his men and he tells them, Hey, you wouldn't happen to be here to fix the toilet, would you? He runs in knocking out the first few men, and then he takes out his gun and starts to shoot out the rest of them. One by one, Yuri's men fall, and then finally Yuri himself. As Jason holds his gun to the last man's head, he pulls the trigger, and he only gets a click. He says that it looks like he's out of ammo, and then he smacks the man with the pistol, telling him, It's okay, I got another. The man shouts, begging for him not to kill him. He has connections. He can get him merchandise, drugs, anything he wants. And Jason tells him that he'll pass. As he holds the gun up to the man, he goes on telling him, I can get you one of the 10 most wanted men. I know where the Joker is. Jason pulls his gun back, telling him, Okay, now you have my attention. It doesn't take long to find out that what the man was saying about having the Joker's location was actually true. However, the problem right now is that he can't hear much because of some audio issues. The one thing that he can really make out is that the Joker is asking if everyone's happy now, because apparently he just shot two of his own men. The Joker was to meet up with some armed traffickers, and he said that he would bring four men with him, and he ended up bringing six. Since the traffickers were getting a little edgy that he brought six, well, the Joker just killed two of his own men to make it more even for them. He shouts, now that we've got that out of the way, shall we continue and get this little shindig into full swing? What the Joker is buying is something new. 
It's a liquid that can travel through water, and once exposed to the air, it bursts into flames. The Joker is revamping his original plan of poisoning Gotham's water supply, so when people turn on their tap, flames will shoot out instead of water. The Trafficker says that he can get them to shipment by water, the Port of Los Angeles, Site 7 in four hours. As the night begins to set, Joker meets up at the docks to get ready for the exchange, but as he stands there, he sees a car speeding towards them. Joker tells one of the traffickers that, ah, uh, there's a dune buggy heading right for us. So do that thing where you shoot at it a lot to make it stop. The traffickers open fire on the car until it comes to a rolling stop right in front of them. But as the traffickers move in to take a look, Joker decides that it's best to just run now. Seconds later, the car releases a gas into the air, causing all of the traffickers to stop and cough, and then Jason jumps out of the trunk and he fires a shot into the Joker's leg. Jason then heads over to where the Joker fell and he tells him, that's gotta hurt. Just hang in there, there's a lot more of it to come. But before he can open fire again, he's shot in the back by the traffickers and the Joker laughs. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot more of that too! Jason quickly grabs the Joker and he pulls him into a warehouse telling himself, It ends right here, right now. And the Joker says, You know, it won't take them long to get through the door. So whatever dance party you've got planned, I'm coming close to pumpkin time! Jason takes out the nozzle of gas and says, Don't worry, this won't take long. And he pours the gas all over the Joker. The Joker laughs as he coughs. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd known this was gonna be that kind of a party, I would've worn shorts! But as he continues to laugh, Jason takes out a lighter telling him, SHUT UP! He looks at the fire thinking, you're gonna laugh at first, but then the pain will hit, and then you'll scream. But after your lungs go out, well, you'll be gone. Jason starts remembering back to when the Joker was hitting him with a crowbar, and then he flips the lighter shut. The next morning, Jason tells Talia that he didn't do it because he was rushed. It just simply wouldn't have been enough. It would have been a quick and agonizing death, and the world would have been a much better place for it, but when he thinks about it, he really doesn't care about the world. He realized that this isn't about the Joker. Hell, it's not even about Bruce or even himself. It's about all three of us. When this ends, however it ends, it'll be me, the Psycho, and Batman. Talia asks if he's still planning on killing Batman, and for a moment, Jason smiles. He says that he knows that she doesn't want him to, and he gets that she loves him, but he's not sure murdering him is part of the plan anymore. Talia says that if you won't murder him, then punish him. Take what is most important to him. Take Gotham from him. Be the man that he never would be. Cross that line. Jason pauses for a moment, and then Talia says that her father is dead. He's... he's gone. Ra's al Ghul is no more. He did it. The Batman. So punish him. Punish him for all of them. And then Talia leans in and grabs Jason by the shirt and kisses him. Later that day, Jason wakes back up to see Talia gone on a message on his computer. The message says that the purchasing of Wayne Tech was successful, and the trail of him never existing ends with the coffin maker. So they also have a new business deal. There's a man going by the name of Hush, and he should probably meet him. Later that night, Hush asks, So you got insight on Batman, right? What's it gonna cost me? And Jason tells him, Nothing. But when the time comes, I want to face him in person. Hush tells him, Fair enough. There's also something else that I've heard. The Riddler claims that he solved the mystery of Batman's identity. He claims that he's Bruce Wayne, is that true? Jason waits for a moment and he tells him, Yeah, Bruce Wayne is Batman. As Jason heads out to the hideout, he finds the company that Bruce uses to make his gadgets is now within his grasp. So everything Batman has, he can have. Talia also left behind another present, a replica of a dagger her father once used. Jason then thinks back to his days as Robin, and Bruce telling him not to take the Joker lightly. That he's not like the others, that he can't be reasoned with. If he's not careful with him, he will die. And as Jason thinks back on those words, he holds up the Red Hood mask. Sitting in the streets, a man is pondering the poor decisions that got him to this point, trying to figure out what he should do. Should he move on? Should he stay here? That's when he feels the drops of blood hitting his forehead. He stands up and he looks to the top of the building, but it's too far. He can't quite make out what's going on. If only he understood how important this moment really was, the true magnitude of what was happening above him. It's because it's actually the battle between the Red Hood and Batman, and that blood is the bats. He falls to the ground and the Red Hood takes out a knife, pointing it directly at him. Tired? Batman thinks about it. This guy likes to talk, but it's not ego, it's a distraction. Red Hood jumps into the air, kneeing Batman in the chin, and Batman realizes whoever this is, he came ready. He fights smart. The knife alone is built to cut through the belt, the body armor, and anything else that Batman uses to protect himself. 
Using the small opening that he sees, Batman grabs the Red Hood by the jacket and hurls him off of the roof. As the Red Hood drives his blade into the wall to stop himself, Batman comes barreling down on top of him, kicking him off of it and sending him to the alley below. He lands on the Red Hood and he begins to swing at his head, but Red Hood reaches up grabbing at the cowl, tearing it off, leaving Bruce Wayne looking back at him. Red Hood and Batman both stand up and they stare at each other. Look at you. I guess we should keep it even, the Red Hood says, as he releases the pressure holding his helmet on. He lets it hit the ground with a thunk, and Bruce stares at him. Oh God. But this is not where the story begins. Oh no. It starts five weeks earlier. Lucius Fox arrived to inform Mr. Wayne that all of his R&D tech is about to hit the public sector due to a hostile takeover of $560 million. They also removed Bruce Wayne from the board of directors. Realizing that this means that at best he loses his future development and at worst every psychopathic enemy of his gains use of the bat toys, Bruce suits up and he heads out for the night. Over in a warehouse in the seedy part of town, a bunch of gang leaders talk about the situation with Black Mask running the show. Then they begin to question who set up this particular meeting, because Black Mask doesn't seem to be here. They all thought it was each other or Black Mask himself. And then a scattering of bullets hits the table and everyone looks up to see the Red Hood standing there with a gun. He welcomes them to his new organization. Here in the Red Hood gang, you'll get total protection from Batman and the Black Mask. Oh, and you have no choice but to join. To hammer home his point, he throws a duffel bag full of heads onto the table. There are your lieutenants. It took me about two hours to kill them all. Imagine what I could do with the whole evening. Word quickly got back to Black Mask, who wasn't exactly happy that he just lost his troops. So he brought in someone else to help kill this mysterious Red Hood, Mr. Freeze. The next night, Batman is off doing his usual, beating up thugs and hanging out on rooftops until Nightwing shows up to say, Hi. Batman turns to him. Are you checking up on me? And Nightwing grins. It's exactly what I'm doing here, in light of recent events. Bloodhaven is your home. New York is where you work now with the outlaws. How does Gotham fit into that? Good to see you too. I'm working a case. If you want to stay, I won't stop you. Meanwhile, Black Mask has his best men working on making Mr. Freeze a new suit. His assistant David walks in telling him that he has information on this new player. He goes by the name Red Hood. Black Mask then looks at a monitor overlooking the harbor. I'm already ahead of you, David. Down on that harbor, thugs are loading up weapons that Black Mask has secured until the big boot of Batman comes flying in, kicking him in the chest. Nightwing jumps in after him, asking the guys, Hey, where'd you get the guns? High-tech gun show or off the internet? The two then show us why they're the greatest superheroes in the world, as they flip, punch, and cartwheel around these thugs, dropping them one at a time. And eventually, they make their way inside, and they pop open one of those crates to find Joker bombs, Captain Boomerang's boomerangs, and Mr. Freeze's guns. Both of them wonder who's been trading off the weapons of Batman's enemies. And then the bombs begin to tick. Batman shouts, move! And through the fire and destruction, Red Hood is watching from the pier. He watches as Batman and Nightwing swim up and he makes sure that they see him as he takes off on the rooftops. Batman and Nightwing give chase and right away they notice that the Red Hood is fast, agile, and capable of every move that he is attempting to make. He's been trained well. And Batman notices that there is something about his moves, something that stands out. Something familiar. As Batman throws a grappling line around the Red Hood's hand, Red Hood cuts it off before it can even go taunt. He looks back at Batman almost as if he knows what Batman is thinking. How did he know that I was going to cut that cord? And then he leaps through a skyline and into a dark room. Nightwing looks at Batman. Impressive. Nothing we haven't seen before. And they both leap. Or done before. They both come crashing in after Red Hood and they look around. Batman tells Nightwing, stay sharp. And that's where we see where this Red Hood character was leading them. Into another warehouse with Amazo. Amazo is a highly advanced android with the abilities and powers of the full Justice League, with the primary function of destroying them. Batman and Nightwing are outclassed in every way. Batman leaps over Amazo's head using bat grenades on him, only to have Amazo knock them away smiling. You'll have to do better than that. Batman turns his back. I did. Amazo then notices another explosive in his leg and the entire area explodes as Batman takes cover. Both Batman and Nightwing run out of the building as Amazo runs through the wall chasing them. As Batman and Nightwing leave, Batman tells him, it's an older model, no plastic man or Green Lantern ring or Wonder Woman lasso. And Nightwing tells him, well, oh, I feel lucky then. Amazo leaps into the air demonstrating flight as he grabs Nightwing, but Batman throws a grappling line onto Amazo's leg and he gets pulled along. 
As Nightwing takes out two Batarangs, he jams them into Amazo's ears. All three of them begin to tumble back down to the ground, and as they catch themselves on a fire escape, Amazo tears it out of the wall. Heat Vision and his strength are displayed as the Caped Crusader and his former sidekick dodge and mess with him. Batman eventually gets his plastic explosives onto Amazo's eyes, taking those out of the equation, and then he runs Amazo over with a Batmobile. As they load up trying to figure out who is buying and selling high-tech villain weapons and killer androids, Red Hood makes a call. He calls up Black Mask and he asks, Can I call you Mr. Mask? Or Blackie? Black Mask replies, telling him, I'm thinking of killing you. And Red Hood tells him, Now that is no way to start our relationship. I have something that you want. Something that you thought you were gonna get. Pretty sure it's a top shelf item. Black Mask curses and then asks, What is it? It's a box filled with 100 pounds of kryptonite. Black Mask's eyes go wide. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna need that. Red Hood negotiates it down to $14 million, tonight, and he gives them a place to meet. But once he hangs up, Black Mask has another idea, and he sends out Mr. Freeze to that location. The door to the warehouse opens, and they walk in with a briefcase of money to show the Red Hood. Red Hood points his guns at Mr. Freeze. How do I know you didn't shove Chinese newspaper under the top layer? Freeze stares at him. It's actually six inches of Gotham Guardian. And he opens fire on Hood. Red Hood fires back with a crack, 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 and the freeze gun blasts the wall with a scrag. Red Hood leaps over, tumbling onto the ground, dodging the regular bullets from the thugs. And then all of the crates in the room open up, showing turrets, and they kill everyone but Freeze. Red Hood then leaps over Freeze's head, slapping a bomb onto his helmet, which blows up, not even breaking the glass. You have succeeded in making me angry. And then a grappling line fires around Freeze's arm, and Batman informs him, "You're not the only one." Nightwing and Red Hood begin trading blows until Red Hood hits another button, popping more turrets out that open fire on Freeze again. Freeze is unfazed as he throws the Batarang aside, and then he blasts the ground, lifting himself into the air and out the roof. Nightwing walks over to Batman to inform him. Red Hood split as well. He's good. Very good. Batman grits his teeth. Yeah. Very good. Later that night, Red Hood walks into an amusement park. It didn't take him long to find the person that he was looking for. It's a reunion of revenge. And this one is particularly funny. He walks into one of the rooms to see the Joker himself sitting there with his head and his knees. He looks up asking, who are you? And the Red Hood grabs him and he raises the crowbar. He brings it across the Joker's face and then he hits him again and again, over and over with no mercy, allowing the blood to fly through the air. And then, as the Joker is unconscious in a pool of his own blood, Red Hood removes his mask and he asks, Tell me, how does that feel? And that's when we see it's Jason Todd, former Robin, former dead Robin. The Red Hood is still off causing problems for Black Mask though, as he blows up another of his transports. Black Mask turns to his assistant, wanting to know, What did we lose? He's told that it's a bunch of rifles, and he responds by telling the assistant to send down a couple of his best men, to which Daniel, his assistant, replies with, he already did, and now they're missing. They look at the situation, and Daniel explains, this guy is sending a message. He isn't stealing the weapons, he's destroying them. Black Mask turns back, well, he's not just our problem, so let's get someone else to take out our trash. Meanwhile, somewhere else in the world, Batman stands with Zatanna at a temple, and she tells him that it's sealed. Can't he see that? Batman tells her, I do. They both look down at the sealed Lazarus pit in front of them. So why did you drag me out here if you already knew that it was sealed? I didn't seal this one when I destroyed them all. All right, but why am I here? Can the Lazarus pit raise the dead? No, it rejuvenates the living. Is that a theory or a fact? I guess it's a fact, but well, it's what I've always heard. Then it's a theory. I still need to know why you wanted me here, Batman. I needed someone that I could trust, but I had to settle for you. He then takes off in the bat plane as Zatanna is left to wonder what that was all about. There is tension between Batman and Zatanna, and it's from Identity Crisis. I'll link that down below. Meanwhile, in Gotham, Onyx is looking at some of the thugs. She jumps down into the group and begins to beat them, demanding to know who they work for. And they tell her, the Red Hood. Meanwhile, over at Star City, Batman is looking at a living Green Arrow. He died and was raised from the dead recently, and Batman wants to know how. Green Arrow explains that he died in a plane crash, and that Hal Jordan gave his gift to him to allow him to return. It's just like that. 
Batman looks at him and he asks, were you preparing for it with any occult actions? And Green Arrow tells him, I died in an explosion on a plane. It's not like I had time to pack a lunch or anything. So Batman takes off again. And as he's soaring through the skies, he gets a call from Onyx, who asks if he knows who this Red Hood guy is. He tells her to tell him if she has the location and call about nothing else. And then he hangs up on her. She sits there frustrated when Red Hood walks up behind her. Those morons I killed were selling drugs to 12 year olds. Hi there, I thought I felt my ears burning. She looks at him, you're the Red Hood. Very astute. What was your first clue? They both look at the thugs and he asks her, so what did I miss? Well, they seem to want to know why Black Mask hasn't killed you himself yet. Well, I guess that tells you that I'm either lucky or very good. Either way, I seem to have made myself an enemy out of all of the bad guys. Over in Metropolis, Batman knocks out a goon as Superman swoops in covering him. I had him, Superman. I never had a doubt. Now, why have you come to Metropolis to stop a bank robbery? If you had called ahead, I would have gotten us theater tickets. I came to talk. Really? Because I was serious about the theater tickets. I really need to talk. All right. Let's talk. Back at the warehouse, Red Hood drops a smoke grenade on the table and he leaps in. You can watch me or join me, it's up to you. And then he jumps into the fight. He throws one guy into a wall and Onyx looks down and decides, why the hell not? Back with Batman and Superman, Batman asks Superman about the time that he died. Superman explains that he didn't die, he mirrored death with a Kryptonian coma. And Batman looks at him, did you? Or is that what we told ourselves so that it would all make sense? I don't know, we've seen a lot of people rise from the dead, Bruce. Metamorpho, Green Arrow, Hal Jordan, it's not science. It has to be for me. I've always had the answers. The facts for every one of them that we lost. Whether they thought it was heaven or God or even magic. Magic is just another realm science. He forms a fist and he raises it. A Superman asks him, what is this about? And Batman softens up. I don't exactly know. Back at the warehouse, the two individuals, Red Hood and Onyx, find themselves surrounded with the bullets flying over their heads. But that doesn't stop them as they kick and drop every enemy that they find until they decide to make a break for the door. They run outside and that's where Hood has a weapon waiting. A Gatling gun. And he opens fire, murdering every single person in the building. Onyx calls out for him to stop. What is he doing? And he takes the barrel of the gun and he shoves it into her chin. What do you think I'm doing? What do you think this is all about? That we're just gonna rough up these guys to teach them a lesson? Welcome to planet Earth, baby. These dead sacks of meat on the floor made their living by beating, raping, and devouring. Fear isn't an answer. I'm not letting you get out of here. That's not really up to you. That's when Onyx notices that Red Hood slid a dagger into her shoulder before she even knew what was going on. And then he pointed the gun right at her. Batman flies back to Gotham thinking to himself, the armor has to be light enough to move to fight, but strong enough to protect. Sometimes, a great many times, it's not strong enough. It didn't protect Barbara who's fighting from a wheelchair, and it wasn't strong enough for Stephanie Brown. And it certainly wasn't strong enough for Jason. Willful Jason, who ignored danger, spat at risk, who was never frightened enough. I've always wondered, always, was he scared in the end? Was he praying that I would come save him? In those last moments when he knew that I wouldn't, did he hate me for it? Back in the alley, Red Hood stands over Onyx and he tells her the truth is, we need to kill everyone. He pulls the knife out, giving her a compression pad to stop the bleeding, and she hits the ground as he tells her, this is the part where you get up and you fight me. Then from behind him, he hears someone has joined the party. He turns his head and Batman tells him, no. Wow, I didn't even hear you land. That plane is really stealthy when you want it to be. You can be so quiet and crack, crack, crack. The Red Hood opens up on Batman with his guns. Batman runs into the building and Red Hood gives chase. Batman runs into the back of it and he slaps an explosive onto a dumpster. So as the Red Hood runs out into the alleyway, he jumps out shooting at Batman. The dumpster explodes, forcing it towards the Red Hood who leaps over it. And as he jumps into the air, Batman throws his grappling line around Red Hood's foot, yanking him back down to the ground. Red Hood chuckles. <laughs> You are beyond thought. You act on instinct, Batman. A finely tuned instrument. A body trained to perfection. Techniques honed and mastered, along with expensive toys. Red Hood slices through the line. But you're not the only one with toys. And he fires a device at Batman, hitting him hard. Batman falls over, telling himself, That's impossible for Red Hood to have that. It's a device from Cord Industries that I ordered from them. Special. How can he have it? No more questions. No more dead ends. No more guessing. Tonight I find out the truth of this. And as Batman tells himself this, he throws explosives at Red Hood, blowing up the area, throwing him aside. They both run along the rooftops as Batman calls out, I need to know! And Red Hood continues to taunt him as they go back and forth. That's right, I want you to ask yourself, what have I done? Tell me, murder! 
No, I've killed, not murdered. Lightning goes off behind the two men as they go back and forth. A kick from Red Hood and then a headbutt, but Batman cuts into the mask. They both tumble over the side of the building and into the alleyway below, where Red Hood tears off Batman's cowl. They stand up and they look at each other, and Red Hood presses the button that releases his helmet telling Batman, I guess we should keep it even then. And Batman looks at him. Oh God. And Jason Todd looks back at him. Now, you want to guess again? This has to be a ruse. Yeah, I think you know it in your gut. You can feel it. You've known it for weeks. Longer even. You knew it when we fought in the graveyard. You felt it when I swapped out with Clayface. That fight began with me and it ended with him. But you know what? I'm standing here in front of you right now. Batman stares at him. How did this happen? Jason touches a batarang with his ungloved hand and then he cuts into his own scalp to put blood on it. How I got here really doesn't matter. Here's my fingerprints and blood for you to check. But no matter what I am, it doesn't matter. That's not what this is all about. I'm the you. You that you are supposed to be. If you had killed the Joker years ago, beyond what happened to me, you could have saved so many people. You could have saved the world. But no, the Joker's murder is a long line of acts that you refuse to commit. You'll never cross that line. But I will. He then presses a button blowing up the helmet and it provides the escape that he needs. Batman went back to the Batcave where he ran the samples and it all added up. Alfred and Batman both realize that it's all true. And he walks over to the old Jason Todd Robin costume. Alfred asks if he wants it removed from the cave. But Bruce tells him no. This changes nothing. And he walks back into the cave, leaving Alfred looking at the Robin suit. With sadness in his eyes. Alfred stands over the grave of Jason Todd as two men ask him if they are needed. Alfred tells them that they are no longer needed. He'll take it from here. They can take five hours off of guarding an unmarked grave. They ask if this means that they are to maintain watch on the other grave sites, the Waynes. And Alfred tells him that they can assume correctly. Then he walks to the wall to inform Batman that it's safe to come in. Which brings us to the graveyard where his body was buried in an unmarked grave. Through the rain and the wind, Batman walks to the grave to retrieve the coffin to confirm that the body is missing from the site. And as he does this, he remembers when he met Jason Todd. It was a late night in Crime Alley, and when he returned to the Batmobile, he found the incredible car on blocks. Someone had taken one of the wheels off of it, and while this perp could have gotten away with it, he decided to come back to get more tires. That's when Batman sees it's a young boy, Jason Todd. Batman went back to the Batcave where he explained to Alfred that they were redesigning the tires and hadn't replaced the hubcaps, along with the security systems being down from the night before. It was the perfect time for someone to take the tires off of the Batmobile. And this boy did just that. Alfred tells him, Well, it seems you and this boy were fated to meet. Jason became Robin, the newest in a line of sidekicks for Batman. Alfred fully believed that if he hadn't intervened, Jason would have become a part of the crime element instead of a sidekick to the Dark Knight. And while at times this boy was brash and over the top, Batman liked having him there. But now things were different. Jason Todd had returned and murdered thieves, crooks, and killers. He returned as the villain the Red Hood after he was supposedly killed at the hands of the Joker. And after revealing his true identity to Batman, Batman has been awake for 80 hours trying to disprove that it is Jason. But early on, Batman saw the anger in Jason's eyes, the darkness within. Jason always wondered why they didn't finish off the thugs, become more brutal with them. They deserved it, didn't they? Wouldn't they just repeat their actions once free again? And as Batman finished his research on the coffin for what must have been the 20th time, he realized what he was missing. There was never a body in this coffin. Jason was never buried. Across town, Black Mask's men are working on their latest project. When Batman comes bursting through the wall yelling for everyone to get out, he runs to the nearby walls, tearing them open to reveal the explosives lining the facility. As he begins to tamper with the bombs, Red Hood comes over the radio. Freezing won't work. I set up sensors so if you tried that it would go off. Batman preps a battle ring to catch the Red Hood, but Hood tells him to calm down. I'm just a fly on the wall, Batman. Batman flings the battle ring, cutting off the camera, and Jason tells him that he has seven seconds to save an empty building. You won't even bother. Batman thinks about it and he leaps out the window as the whole building explodes. And from a building nearby, Jason tells himself, I love to watch him work. 
The Black Mask gets the report that the Red Hood has just taken out a whole building, ruining an entire operation. He's also riding around blowing up the transport trucks, killing the men and destroying the weapons. On top of that, he's purposely finding all of the manufacturing locations and killing everyone inside. He's eliminating all competition, and Black Mask freaks out. Then why isn't he dead? His assistant tells him, truth? He's better than anyone we have. Black Mask asks again, why isn't Batman removing the problem then? His assistant offers the idea that maybe Batman is letting the gangs fight it out. And Black Mask asks, what is this? A tennis match? No, he can't catch this guy either. Black Mask looks out the window. Can you feel it? We're stuck in the damned crosshair. And then he realizes what's outside his window. Red Hood, looking at him with an RPG pointed right at his office. Damn it to hell! Black Mask yells as he runs out of the room. Jason snickers. <laughs> wow, he can really run when he wants to. And he launches the RPG, taking out the entire floor. As both Black Mask and his assistant are now wandering the streets, Black Mask asks, how did he do that? The whole floor was fortified against airstrikes. And his assistant informs him, all except the east window. They were repairing it. As furious as he is over what happened, a man from behind him asks, Do you want some help? Everyone turns their guns to whoever this is, and that's when they see. It's Deathstroke. Black Mask tells everyone to drop their guns. You'll all be dead before you run out of ammo. Smart man. I've come representing the society, and I'd like to know if you want to join. Both Batman and Jason are watching from cameras, and they both respond with an affinitive. Damn it. The offer was simple. If Black Mask saddles up with the society, Deathstroke and this organization will supply him with a super-powered individual who can take out the Red Hood. But he's kind of angry after they present their offering. They gave him a couple of super-powered individuals, Captain Nazi and Hyena. Deathstroke tells him, I think you're underestimating the Nazi and Hyena. But Black Mask isn't about to back down. The Nazi is like 150 years old and he's blind. You gave me a blind supervillain. Not entirely, Mask. He has cybernetic implants that help him see. In black and white, if the Red Hood steps in front of a Christmas tree, he vanishes. And I thought the hyena was dead. One of them is dead. This is the other one. I thought the other one was a chick. For all I know, this one is a chick. I didn't care to check under the hood. How about you? Pass. Deathstroke has had about enough with the Black Mask's attitude, though, as he tells him, listen to me. I say this not with respect, but as a reminder that I'm a breath away from killing all of you. There's a third member on the way, and it makes this whole thing a perfect combo. The Red Hood will be dead. Fine. And Black Mask and Deathstroke look out over the city. Hyena looks kind of like a girl from behind. I was thinking the same thing, Mask. A short while later, as Red Hood is killing more of the Black Mask's friends, the Nazi and Hyena leap in to kill him like they're supposed to. Red Hood flips out of the way. Oh my goodness, I've been bamboozled. He lands opening fire on them. You people aren't the most subtle strategists. They keep leaping at him and he keeps shooting, but the Nazi continually blocks the shots. After throwing grenades at them, he blows up the Nazi, but Hyena jumps on him, pinning him down. The Hyena growls at him. Too slow. And he tells Hyena, or I'm stalling. Yeah, I'm stalling. Batman leaps in, knocking the Hyena out as Red Hood asks him. What took you so long? Couldn't decide if you wanted me to live? Batman puts up his fists alongside Jason, telling him, shut up and fight. Almost like it's programmed into them, they're right back to working as a team, using combos and team maneuvers to fight off against the enemy. And as they're beating down on the Nazi, Count Vertigo arrives, dropping Batman and Red Hood by screwing with their ears and eyes, something that doesn't affect the Nazi and Hyena. While Jason is down, Batman turns on a mode on his cowl to block the effects of Vertigo when he gets back up. But it's not enough. He's still not fighting at 100% capacity, and Jason has an idea. He crawls over to Hyena, jamming needles with adrenaline into Hyena, driving it mad! Batman gets Vertigo sent onto the Mad Hyena, and it lunges onto its own teammate. During this time, Nazi has gotten back up, and he begins to choke out Red Hood. But that's when Red Hood grabs a taser, shoving it into the Nazi's cybernetic eyes, burning out his entire head and killing him. Red Hood leaps up to a fire escape, telling Batman, Just be happy I only killed one Nazi today. Batman watches as his former sidekick, the boy that he saved, runs off. Now, a mass murderer. And he realizes, it's time for this to end. Our finale begins with Alfred opening up a package from Jason and telling Batman to get back here for it. Batman rushes to the Batmobile where, elsewhere, Black Mask is telling his men that they've failed him. He opens fire, murdering all of them before turning back to someone behind him, asking, Happy? And Red Hood replies with, Getting there. 
As you can see, Black Mask has finally decided to stop trying to fight Red Hood. Back in the Batcave, Alfred opens up the package to find nothing more than a lock of green hair. Batman knows right away what this means. Jason Todd has his own murderer captive. He has the Joker. Back with Black Mask and Red Hood, Black Mask asks him, What the hell do you mean getting there? I just signed a contract by wasting all of my second in commands. Hood doesn't even uncross his arms. And I appreciate that. I don't want your damned appreciation. I expect your obedience. I think you may have misunderstood the terms of our agreement, Mask. Really? You come to me wanting to end this, claiming that you are done with the whole Mad Bomber routine and wanting a seat at the table. But now my gut is telling me that you had a change in attitude. Am I wrong? Red Hood doesn't even move. Probably not. And Black Mask cracks a stool over his head. He pulls out a gun to shoot Hood, and that's when Red Hood leaps into the air, kicking him and grabbing the gun. They go back and forth with Red Hood throwing Black Mask out of the window into the front. After all of your attempts to have me killed, you hide behind a mask. I'm not afraid. You're just another gangster. Black Mask looks up at him. Look who's talking about myths and dress up. He jumps back into the building and he stomps on Red Hood's chest and then he pins him to a pool table. Red Hood pulls out his knife and he begins to take a swipe at him. And then Mask stumbles back into a bunch of pool cues where he grabs one, breaking it over Hood. And then he stabs him in the back. All of their fighting has started a fire in the building and Mask throws his coat aside furious. The two men lock arms, determined to end this right here and right now. And that's when Batman pulls up to the building and he watches as Hood goes in to stab Mask and Mask grabs his arm, flipping it around, stabbing Jason Todd in the chest. Mask goes and he removes the helmet to find out who's actually been taunting him. And when he does that, we see that Jason hasn't been here this whole time and Batman is relieved. Not him. Mask looks up to see Batman there. When did you get here? A radio then goes off in the mask. Oh, I invited him. Tonight's just full of reunions. That's when we see Jason has his mask off and he's holding the Joker. Didn't I kill you? We've been over this. I know, but I like talking about it. <laughs> Back with Batman and Mask, Mask turns to Batman. What do you mean, not him? Do you know who this psycho is? That's when the helmet grows hotter and hotter, and Batman yells for Mask to drop it. He kicks it away from Mask, watching it explode in the back of the building, and once that's resolved, Batman asks Mask how Hood contacted him. And Mask explains that his assistant was murdered and thrown through his window with a cell phone taped in his mouth. He's been playing me, Batman, and I think you know exactly how that feels. Back with Jason and Joker. Dead man walking! <laughs> yeah, that wasn't funny the first five times. Two times, boy chick! That makes three, and comedy works best in threes. Like Batman, Robin, and me. Let's ask the $24,000 question. You left me to live. After everything I did, you couldn't pop my balloon. You just couldn't! The apple doesn't fall far from the paterfamilias. You're just like daddykins. That was enough for Jason as he jumped in, kicking Joker across the face, and then he threw a knife, pinning him to the wall. The only thing everyone in the room could hear was the laughter as Jason pulled out the knife. <laughs> Jason leaned into the Joker's face. I know a secret about you. You're not nearly as crazy as you'd like us all to believe, or even as crazy as you'd like to believe. It just makes it easier to justify all of the sick things that you've done. The Joker looks away without a smile on his face. Look at that. I wiped the smile off the Joker's face. I've been waiting a long time for that. <laughs> Back with Batman and Mask, he takes the clues and he leaves Mask there surrounded by mini explosives, telling him to stay put. Mask simply tells him, oh yeah, because I'm known for my patience. Batman goes to Crime Alley where Jason walks out telling him, this only seemed fitting. The place of your birth, the place of our first meeting, and now, where this ends. Batman looks at him, where is he? And Jason tells him, I have him in the other building, but don't try ditching me and finding him. I rigged that building to explode. Now that would be fitting payback wise. I'm not going to let you kill him. You can try and stop me. And they both prep the fight. And that's when a plane above Bloodhaven drops the living bomb onto the city. Batman is forced to watch as what appears to be a nuclear explosion goes off in Bloodhaven. He calls out, Dick! And Jason confirms it. My God, is that where Nightwing is? Imagine that. One son returns from the grave as another enters it. What a fitting ending this has become. If he's there, you're too late, Bruce. Again. Batman leaps over in the direction of Bloodhaven, but an explosion goes off at his feet. Jason, please! 
What? You have to be sure? Getting out of that alive would be one hell of a neat trick. If old Dickie is there, he's dead. And if you leave, someone else dies tonight. Batman leaves in throwing two batterings that graze Jason's neck. But Jason counters by throwing a sticky to Batman's cape, and then the other end is attached to a rocket that launches him into the sky. Batman grips the edge of the roof trying to keep himself there, and the Joker watches the explosions as he comments, This is getting good! Jason jumps on Batman as he begins to swipe away with his knife as he holds Batman's head back. Batman realizes that Jason isn't playing anymore. He's going for kill shots. He has to respond properly. And he throws an explosive onto Jason's coat, burning up all of his tools. Now let's see how you do without your toys. He throws himself into a window and Batman follows suit telling him, You say that you want to save Gotham, to kill a part of it so that it could survive. You say that you want to be better than me, but it won't happen. All the while, he's beating on Jason, throwing him around, and as he stands over, the defeated Jason Todd. I know I failed you, but I tried to save you, Jason. I'm trying to save you now. And Jason points a gun at Batman's face. Is that what you think this is about? You letting me die? I don't know what clouds your judgment worse. Your guilt or your antiquated sense of morality. Bruce, I forgive you for not saving me. Batman looks on saddened by the thought. And Jason gets up, opening the door that holds the Joker. But why in God's name is he still alive? And in the room, the Joker laughs. <laughs> we got ourselves a party! Jason walks in, punching Joker in the chin, knocking him over into the explosives, and he shoves the gun into his face, ignoring what he has done in the past, the friends that he crippled. I thought, I thought killing me, I would be the last person that you would ever let him hurt. If it had been you that was left in a bloody mess in that room, I would have done nothing but search the planet for this pathetic pile of evil, this death-worshipping garbage, and I would have sent him off to hell. You don't understand. You've never understood. What? Your moral code? It's too hard to cross that line? I want him dead. Maybe more than anything I've ever wanted before, but if I do, if I allow myself to go down that path, I'll never come back. Why? Why what? Why do all of the Cub Scouts and Spandex always say that? If I cross the line, there's no coming back. I'm not talking about killing Cobblepot or Scarecrow. I'm talking about him. Just him. Doing it because he took me away from you. Well, you don't have a choice, Jason tells him, throwing him a gun. You either kill him or I will. And if you want to stop me, you'll have to kill me. Me or him. Decide. Put the gun down, Jason. One. Don't. Two. No! Three. And in that moment, Batman threw a battering into Jason's neck. And as the blood spilled onto the ground, Jason hit the dirt. The Joker laughed at it all. <laughs> after all of that, you found a way to win. And yet, everyone loses. Don't you just love how this is ending? Joker then grabs the gun, shooting the explosives next to him. And the entire building goes up in smoke and fire. You see, fate is a funny thing. It swells up like raging waters that we are forced to travel. It provides no exit, no deviation. It drops us in a bottomless ocean and compels us. We either swim or drown. And sometimes, as we struggle against the tide, a great truth arises. And there you have it, the conclusion to the origin and under the Red Hood storyline of Red Hood. It's a little all over the place because the original storyline just has him dying. Lost Days shows a part of his return, kind of. And then under the Red Hood is the big reveal that he was there. They don't flow easily together, but hey, I thought it would be a good one to do for you guys. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, and I'll see you next time right here.